Thanks, Madeline. Thanks, Nikki. Well, friends, good morning. Uh, it's good to be with everyone this morning. My name is Tony Sundermeyer. I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Let me welcome everyone who's in the room in person with us. Let me also welcome everyone who is joining us remotely via uh, live stream. We're, we're so thankful that we have this technology during the course of this past year to stay connected, uh, to uh, worship together. Uh, we're thankful that we have opportunities now to come back in person, and we're going to continue to do that in the weeks ahead. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you do want to be in person, uh, that you use our reservation system, as these folks have today. 
uh, and that helps us uh, plan for seating as we continue to be socially distanced. People are wearing masks uh, in worship spaces, uh, and they're six feet apart from each uh, pod, each household. Uh, we're very thankful, again, that we have the opportunity to worship together. We are one church, whether we're in person or remote. I encourage you to let us know that you're participating today by using our uh, text message check-in. Uh, for those in the room, take out your phones. For those who are at home, do the same. Uh, you can text in uh, the phrase first, 1ST. You're going to text that phrase to the number 313131. If you've never used this before, that's what you're going to do. Text the phrase first, 1ST, to the number 313131. If you've used it before, you're going to text uh, the word check-in to that same number, 313131. That's check-in to 313131. Uh, and that gives us uh, the opportunity to greet you with a return text, give you a link for the order for worship and the liturgy that we'll be participating in today in this season of Lent. Uh, the Easter Memorial Fund is still open. This is a fund to purchase flowers for Easter Sunday. I encourage you to do that if you are planning to do that, to memorialize or to honor a loved one. Uh, you can reach out to Stephanie Lane, our Senior Director for Communications and Connections, uh, or you can go on our website, firstpresatl.org forward slash give, uh, and that can direct you to giving memorial flowers uh, as well as uh, general giving to the church. Uh, we had a new members class uh, just a few weeks ago. They gathered in the sanctuary. Even in COVID time, it's been amazing. Uh, people have connected to the church principally through uh, remote worship and remote uh, formation opportunities, remote small groups, uh, etc. And we had, um, we had a handful of folks join the church. Uh, two households had actually never been on our campus before. They had only connected through our virtual worship. I know there's many of you who are in the same uh, category. You're worshiping with us even now uh, who haven't been here at the corner of 16th and Peachtree. But I do want to name uh, those names, those individuals who have uh, joined the church uh, just recently. They were accepted on Tuesday with the session, welcomed in. Uh, Leon and Ray Broadhead, uh, Brian Brooks and John Halpert, uh, Katie and Jack Elmore, Catherine and Ted Fleming, who I think are here. Hello, Flemings. Good to see you. Uh, Mary Gowing, Hillary Maddox, and Beatrice White. And so we welcome them uh, to the faith and membership life of the church. As I said to them and as I say to each, every, each and every one of us, we're not uh, the church who we're called to be unless these folks have said yes. Uh, to be part of our faith and our life together. We're more of the church Christ is calling us to be. So we're grateful uh, for these individuals and these households. I do have some pastoral concerns to pass on before we move into our time of worship. Um, we grieve with Un Mi and Hans Lee and their children, all are members of the church, on the death of Un Mi's mother, Jay Sun Ro, who died on Friday afternoon. We also grieve the death of longtime church member Gladys Barber, who died on March 17th. Our prayers go out to Gladys's children and their spouses, all who live within the greater Atlanta area. Our thoughts and our prayers are with member David Boone, whose mother Esther Nielsen died early Saturday morning in Erie, Pennsylvania. And we want to congratulate Leslie Peer, a daughter of this church, on her marriage yesterday to Daniel Hackett, Leslie grew up here. Her parents are Bill and Carrie Peard, uh, and we're thankful as they start their new life together. And it's just so good to have a wedding back on campus in these times. Well, our call to worship is um, printed in your order for worship. It's not responsive. I'm going to read it uh, as we prepare our hearts uh, to come together in worship today and to receive the gifts that God is uh, giving us in this time. Each day is a gift from God. Each moment is that opportunity to reach out in service to all creation. Each day is a reminder of the new covenant, not written on stone tablets, easily broken, but inscribed on our hearts, filled with joy and hope. Each day we draw closer to God, who has forgotten more than we ever learn, who has forgiven us more than we ever acknowledge. And so friends, let us worship our God. Oh. 
Christian swallow where our Savior trod the Lamb victorious Christ the Son of God lift high the cross the love of Christ proclaim till all the world adore his sacred name all newborn servants of the crucified Christ who died, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaimed, till all the world adore his sacred name. O Lord, once lifted on the glorious tree, Friends, you may be seated. Please join me in this morning's prayer. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day when God can be found. God of all breath of life, living water, savior, friend. Come as the hungry, feed on his word. Come as the thirsty, drink of his love. Come as the faithful, worship the Lord. O oh God of truth, prepare our minds to hear and heed your holy word. Fill every heart that longs for you with your mysterious presence. Hear our prayer. Teach us to love eternal truth and seek its freedom everywhere. Recognizing we worship a God of promise and saving grace, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we all pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. do 
don't deserve it till you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. to me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. First scripture reading comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, oh yeah, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt covenant that they broke though I was their husband says the Lord but this but this the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other know the Lord for their shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive the iniquity and remember the sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Rhodes. Uh, At this time, if there's children who are going to participate in godly play, they can go uh, with Miss Katie over there. And we're thankful that our children are with us in worship today as well. Well, before I read our uh, second text, I want to remind everyone that our mission uh, at the First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta is to humbly follow Jesus Christ. And during this season of Lent, um, we consider a very specific and particular aspect of uh, that call uh, and a particular aspect of what that journey is all about. For in this season, we recount the stages and we recount the steps of Jesus' sojourn to the cross. And for over uh, two millennia, uh, the cross and Christ's sacrifice, its meaning, 
Uh, its efficacy, themes of repentance, themes of atonement, themes of reconciliation, all of these are a focal point uh, for this 40-day season. And today's text from the Gospel of John, uh, which comes to us again in this Lenten season, is yet another reminder of this very particular focus. Now, the text itself that I'm about to read is a little chronologically wonky, uh, because next week is Palm Sunday, Uh, We'll tell the story of Jesus' triumphal entry next week, of him entering into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast and the festival of the Passover. Uh, We begin Holy Week next Sunday. Well, in the text I'm about to read for us today, chapter 12 of John's Gospel, uh, Jesus has actually already entered into Jerusalem. It's one of these wonky features in the lectionary. It's a text that the lectionary uh, authors want us to read but it falls after uh, the triumphal entry. So we're going to go back in time next week to read that story. But just for context, Jesus has already entered into uh, Jerusalem. And in this particular story, and I think the reason why the lectionary uh, authors and contributors want us to hear this story in Lent is because in this story, Jesus speaks very plainly about who he is. He speaks very plainly about how his mission in this particular moment was on the precipice of being fulfilled. So I invite you all to listen now to God's word to us from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered those disciples, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this reason that I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Friends, this too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, break open this uh, ancient word afresh to us this day uh, so that we'd be changed, so that we'd be different people than those who joined into worship today, whether in person or remote, that you would speak to us right where we are, and transform us, and change us, and encourage us, and equip us to press on in this Lenten season. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you've driven uh, north on Peachtree Street during the pandemic, during COVID time, particularly on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, you might have noticed a large gra- crowd of, uh, of people gathered along a tall black fence on the west side of Peachtree, just outside the Shepherd Center. For those who are unfamiliar with it, I know many here in Atlanta are familiar with the Shepherd Center, but for those who don't know, uh, it's a 152-bed hospital that focuses on uh, the medical care for people who've had spinal cord injuries or brain injuries or MS or other neuromuscular problems. Because of COVID over the past 12 months, as you all know, family members have been unable to get into the hospital, which is quite difficult because 
people who are being served by the Shepherd Center usually are being served for a very long time, so they're unable to see uh, their family in the hospital. So throughout the week, what they've adjusted and how they've pivoted, uh, but again, it happens mostly on Saturday and Sunday, there are dozens and dozens of people in masks lining the fence on Peachtree Street talking to their loved ones who have been brought out by aides and by nurses into an outdoor plaza so these families can still connect, so these families can still visit with one another. But it all happens through this fence. And you can imagine with people along a fence, they're, they're holding on to the bars and they're, they're leaning in. And, and because it's so spacious and so wide, they're, they're trying to speak so their loved ones can hear them. And their loved ones, many who are injured, many who are in serious rehabilitation, are trying to speak back to them and trying to communicate with one another as best they can through this fence. I, I have found that image Every time I've driven by and have seen this, I've found that image to be bittersweet. On one hand, there is on display, right, this great desire to be with their loved ones. There's this great desire these family members have just to get close to the ones that they love, to lay their eyes on them, right, and, and to, hear, to hear their voice. They don't want to get near to them as, as, as possible. They, they have come week after week after week after week, and they keep coming back. And, and I have to say that the sight of that is incredibly encouraging. It's a witness and a testimony to incarnational love, right, that shows up in the hard moments of our lives, even if it's through a fence, even with masks on. It's a concrete, real-time example of love. On the other hand, there's still distance, right? We know this to be true in so many ways. There's, there's still a fence. There, there's still masks. There's still masks. They can't hold hands. They can't share a hug or a kiss or have a, a private conversation about their care or share their sadness or grief or anger regarding their illness or their rehabilitation. All of this, of course, would have been possible if we weren't in a pandemic. And I've thought a lot about those scenes over the course of COVID. I've been able to see people line up on that fence. I especially thought about that image during this week. Because in the opening line of our text from John 12, we're told that some Gentiles have come earnestly looking for Jesus. Now, we don't know if these Gentiles mystic uh, Greek-speaking Jews or if they were pagans. But what we do know is that they wanted to get close to Jesus. That's what they wanted, they uh, desired. Uh, they wanted to see him, right? They wanted to see him. Word continued to spread about all the signs and wonders Jesus had performed. Am I good, Gavin? So word uh, continued to spread about Jesus, right? He's, it, word has gotten out and people are wanting to see him. And in, in, in previous verses and chapters in the Gospel of John, we find the story, right, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. That's the story that precedes the one that, that I've read. And, and then, and then uh, the triumphal entry has already happened. People have seen Jesus be hailed as a king. So these Gentiles, right, they have this earnest desire in wanting to see him and wanting to get close to, them, to him. And yet, right, John, I don't know if you picked this up. It's quite subtle. But John gives the impression that these Gentiles don't actually get close to Jesus. There's nothing in the text that says that they got to see him. From this text, it seems like those Gentiles were like those family members, right, around the fence. They're, they're like on the outside looking in. They want to be closer and closer and closer, but there's still a fence between them, almost getting there, almost getting there, but not quite yet. Perhaps, perhaps, this is a, a good analogy for some of us and our experience of Jesus. Perhaps this is a good analogy even of our experience of the Christian faith. Right, on one hand, 
we have a desire to get close to Jesus. I'm making that assumption because you're in the room or you're tuning in via live stream that there is a desire in your life where you want to know Jesus more. You want to know his power in your life. You want to know his purpose in your life. We also possess a desire for the gap we often sense that is between us and Christ. We want that gap to shrink. That's an outcome of of a, of a faith that wants to mature each and every day, that we want that gap to shrink, right? We want the fence to be torn down. And yet, like those Gentiles, it's often the case, uh, there's season in, seasons in our faith and our life together where we are like those Gentiles, we're like those along the fence, and the distance hasn't been bridged in our spiritual life. That we just can't, feel like or seem to get close enough to Christ the way that we one time want to. Sometimes it, it feels like there's a fence between us. And if you're feeling those things today, if you're feeling those things today, I want to let you know that you are absolutely not alone. Individually and corporately, it seems like all of us are kind of lining the fence we're lining the fence and we want to get close. We have that desire to get close. But there's so many things that create distance between us and Christ. And that is why I would suggest that worship is one of the most important practices in our faith and our life together. Because even if you're sitting here today and you're feeling distant from God, like there's a fence between you, if you're tuning in and you feel like there is a gap that hasn't been bridged, the gift of worship is that Jesus actually, we believe this, comes close to us in this time. Not only that, we actually believe that he is still speaking to us through his word. That we are actually within earshot, the way those family members are within earshot of one another, even though there's distance, it seems, we still can hear. We still can hear what he says. And this very morning, I believe that Jesus is speaking to us in a very particular way. He said this, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Even if it feels like we're on the other side of the fence, we cannot ignore what we've just heard. Jesus is speaking to us even now. He's communicating something to us about who he is, communicating to us something about what he came for. He's, he's trying to tell us that he is this single grain. He is the definite, unique, and matchless son of God. He is the divine human one who will be crucified, who will be buried in the earth in a borrowed tomb, and who will be exalted in triumph and in glory on Easter Sunday, thus declaring to all people, in all places, in all time, that the principalities and powers of death are illegitimate. And they cannot and will not defeat the living God. He is the seed that is going to die and be buried in the earth. And through his death, something is born. Through his death, imagine this, a wheat field is born. A crop is born. And friends, we are that wheat field. We are the crop we are the undeserving yet beloved heirs of the benefits of his obedience. We no longer fear death. And we know that life is absolutely worth living and living to the full. We are forgiven. We are accepted. We are reconciled and we are loved and we're called to bear witness how resurrection may bear fruit in our lives that loves and blesses the world. And so as Christ's wheat field, we're called to replicate what I would call his cruciform and sacrificial pattern 
of life. We too are called to be like that grain, like that seed. We're called to die to self. You heard it again in this text. To die to self and to be born again in spirit and in truth. And as we're born again, we bear fruit for the kingdom when we follow Jesus in this particular way. And in this very text, right, he says as much. He says it to us, to anyone who would call him Lord, anyone who wants to bear the name Christian, he's speaking to that person. Whoever serves me, he said, whoever serves me must follow me. Not think about following me. Consider following me. Must follow me. And where I am, where I am, there will my servant be also. And we have to ask, where is he? Where is he? What road does he choose? Where is he going in these coming days? And we know this full well, and we're getting a clearer and clearer glimpse as we press on in the Lenten season. We know he is going to the cross. And we're called to follow him there. We're called into this cruciform and sacrificial life. Now, I want to drill down a bit because there is some nuance that I believe has to be understood by the Christian body, by the Christian church, if we are indeed going to follow after Jesus and understand a little bit more of what we mean when we speak of sacrifice. I want to talk very specifically now about sacrifice and that word and the power of that word and the misuse of that word over time, even by the Christian church. Because if I'm asking you and I'm inviting you to consider a cruciform and sacrificial way of living, we have to understand what sacrifice actually means in light of the gospel. And to do that, I want to note this fundamental difference between two ideas of sacrifice. There is a difference between a self-willed and self-determined sacrifice, like the one Jesus made. There's a difference between that And what Canadian pastor and author Martha Tatanik calls enforced sacrifice or imposed sacrifice. Jesus is sovereign, friends. We we have to name this. He is sovereign in his decision to be obedient to God. And he's perfectly obedient to God because he is God. Jesus' death on the cross is not some sort of uh, enforced or imposed sacrifice. God doesn't force this on Jesus, impose this on Jesus, thus rendering it some sort of sick form of divine child abuse. That's not what's happening here. Jesus actually wills the road to the cross. He chooses that way. He even says as much in this text. He said, should I say, Father, save me from this hour? Should I say that? No, he says. This is the very reason I came. In other words, this is what I've chosen to do. This is why I'm here. Now, friends, that doesn't mean the road won't trouble him. That doesn't mean that the road will be void of hardship or suffering. This is a truth in the spiritual life. Obedience and trouble are not mutually exclusive. Obedience and trouble are not mutually exclusive. Again, he says as much in this text, and we know he prays it later on in the Garden of Gethsemane, a prayer that we're going to overhear again in the coming days. Yet even in the midst of how this road troubles him, he still walks it. He still chooses it. He walks this road knowing full well that if people who have the power to actually impose sacrifice get their hands on him, that crucifixion would eventually be his fate. Even with that, even with that prospect, he chooses it. He chooses it. It's not forced upon him. It's born out of his own will. And that will brings him to Jerusalem and eventually to Golgotha. This self-determined sacrifice is the antithesis of imposed sacrifice, of enforced sacrifice. Enforced sacrifice, friends, is what the religious leaders and the Romans willed. It's what they conspired and what they pulled off against Jesus. Enforced sacrifice does bodily and spiritual and and, and psychological harm to the so-called scapegoat. The one we blame for what ills us and what ills the world. Enforced sacrifice, horrifically, was what we saw this last week in our city. 
The deadly mixture of toxic Christianity, racism, and misogyny made itself known once again as eight people became the scapegoat for one white man's self-professed sins. He didn't sacrifice. He didn't die to his addictions or die to racism or die to misogyny or die to his combative and punitive and patriarchal version of Christianity. He didn't die to sin. He killed. He enforced sacrifice on eight people who were made in the image of God. He enforced sacrifice on Asian women because he believed they were the cause of his and the world's problems. Do I have to even say it? That is not the way of Jesus Christ Self-willed sacrifice is the way of Christ. Enforced sacrifice, let me not mince words, is from the devil. It's from the devil. Enforced sacrifice is at the heart of terrorism. Self-willed sacrifice is at the heart of martyrdom. Enforced sacrifice is often born out of racism and and dehumanization and self-willed sacrifice is born of inclusion and the acknowledgement of the image of God in every person. Enforced sacrifice swims in the waters of fear and hatred and power grabs. And self-willed sacrifice swims in the waters of love and empathy and self-emptying. Enforced sacrifice is how we lose ourselves and we lose our humanity. And self-willed sacrifice is how we gain it. And forced sacrifice promotes only death. And self-willed sacrifice promotes the beauty and goodness of life. And self-willed sacrifice is the road Jesus invites us to travel. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Friends, the way of Christ is self-willed sacrifice. It is not imposed sacrifice. Imposed sacrifice does not belong to the gospel in any form or function. And friends, we must choose this way. In small things and in great things, we must. We must. There is no other option. No other option. Available to us, lest we forsake our Lord and forfeit the name Christian. So my encouragement today is that we choose sacrificial living. A cruciform kind of life that understands what sacrifice Jesus made and understands what kind of sacrifices we're called to make make and not called to make. May we be formed by the cross and by his sacrifice. And may we choose his way, the way that he chose for us and our salvation. Lord, we give you thanks that your word continues to speak to us 2,000 years after it's been written, that it's relevant and timely and poignant for us, and that today, once again, you invite us to choose this day whom we will serve, to choose, in the words of Jeremiah, to let the law of God be written on our hearts. We pray that that would happen in this church and in our individual lives and all the temptations that we have, all the temptations that we have to impose sacrifice on others. We pray that you'd forgive us. We pray that we don't act on those and we choose a different way. And we pray that your church would be authentic in choosing this way and that we would be able to purge by your grace and your spirit anything, anything in this church that hints of imposed sacrifice. Give us the courage and the grace to continue to follow you even to the cross. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let
let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thy ocean depths its flow may richer That followest all my way, I yield my fickling torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray, that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. O oh, joy that seekest me through pain. trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be oh cross that liftest up my head Each and every day gives us an opportunity to choose the way of Jesus in small things and in great things. May we as a church and individually continue to preach the cruciform and sacrificial way of Jesus. May we understand what that means. May we understand that it's born of our own will by God's grace to choose that way in our relationships, in our work, in our ministries, and in the world. And as we make those choices, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. May his peace live inside of you this day and every day ahead. Amen. And go in peace.